Well, today I'm going to uh, talk about something. We're going to have like a pastoral conversation, if you will. And I would ask that you would kind of uh, go the distance with me in this. I think some of you are going to be encouraged uh, by what we talk about. Uh, and others may be a little challenged as we go along. But I pray that you would, um, as we go through this, uh, that you would have an open heart and mind and just listen uh, from beginning to end what we're going to talk about today because it's one of the most pressing things that as a culture uh, we have dealt with. It is a, uh, this is a message, a topic that I first preached uh, about in 1992. Some of you were not alive, uh, but I was and I was preaching. I was about a year into a senior ministry and um, I was thrust into a national situation as many of us were back in those days. Uh, where um, Rodney King uh, was arrested and was beaten by um, uh, L.A. Police Department. And then a year later in his trial in 1992, the police were acquitted. And so it just erupted, uh, and the boiling point um, back in those days uh, went all over the country. And this is not a, um, you know, a, you know, shame on the police type thing because our men and women who serve us and our first rep responders are uh, do our um, our respect and our admiration because they put their life on the line every single day, and yet um, they know among their own ranks uh, that it's a very difficult thing, and there are some people who go way beyond what they should do. They don't serve and protect as they should, and so the men and women who serve in uniform, this is not a, a bash them day. It's just a, a reality over time and throughout history that this has happened. And you see it even on protests that are going on today uh, where uh, police are, um, you know, they're, they're in a difficult situation. And so, but what we find as a nation and as a culture is this, this animosity and this thing that bubbles up from time to time. And some people live with it all of the time. Um, and so a couple of years ago, uh, when George Floyd um, was killed on the streets of Minneapolis, again, um, not the last, or, but it was in a string where the frustration of so many people in our country boiled up, and it was a very difficult time. And so we talked about that then uh, for a couple of weeks in a row. I did, and I, at that point, I, I realized, you know, there is an issue that we have, and it's not just an American issue. This is an issue of prejudice and and racist thoughts of bigotry uh, that permeate humankind. This is not an American problem. This is a human sin problem that is in every culture, in every era of history. And so it, I, it dawned on me because um, so many people struggle with this, and some more than others, that I needed as your pastor... Uh, and it's not, I'm not preaching about this today because I think uh, that we've got a huge problem at Journey. I don't, that's not what I'm doing. But I realized that I have a voice in our community and I have a voice in our culture. And it's my job to, to kind of call people and say, hey, there's an issue that so many people struggle with and there is harm that's done. Um, you know, interpersonal harm, things at work, things on the road, th everywhere, that if we uh, could grapple with this as Christians and deal with this, it would go a long way. I don't have a major platform. We've got a, you know, a church that's a drop in the bucket compared to the, you know, the masses that are out there. But what I want to do as a pastor is I want to be faithful to what God is asking me to do uh, in leading you and encouraging you along the way. And so that's what uh, this is really about today. And so um, this is not a moment where something is going on. I, I like preaching about this when I don't have to preach about it. Does that make sense? And so there's not, you know, there's not something major going on right now. So it's a time where we can come without emotions high, where we can just say, hey, let's have a conversation about that. And this is really what this is. It's a conversation. Uh, as you know, February is Black History Month. And uh, I thought I would do a little bit about black history that has nothing to do with the United States. All right? It has everything to do with the spiritual history of black people from the very beginning of the pages of Scripture. And hopefully, you're going to learn something that you didn't know, or maybe you know all of this and you could add to what I'm going to talk about today. But I think it's just helpful when it comes to uh, our brothers and sisters of color to understand this rich spiritual heritage they have in the pages of Scripture, and it's from beginning to end uh, in the Bible. For example... 
Uh, you all have heard the name of Noah. Noah had four sons, or three sons, Japheth, Shem, and Ham, and that really is a play on, uh, on how they looked like. It was like their nickname. So Japheth, his name means light or bright, so he was a light-skinned uh, son. Shem was dusk or brown, so more of a brown uh, uh, color in his skin. And then Ham was burnt or dark, so this, was, this would be, uh, as you'll see here in just a second, a lot of African uh, people came from the line of Ham. And so those were the sons of Noah. And if you'll notice, Ham's sons, they were the, the, that's where Ethiopia began, and Egypt began, and Libya, and Canaan began. And so these are the lines of the sons of Ham, who was one of the sons of Noah. For example, when we talk about Egypt, Joseph, if you'll remember, Joseph was uh, the vice pharaoh in Egypt, and he actually married an Egyptian woman, again, from the line of Ham, which is very dark skin, and, he beca- and she became the mother of Manasseh, which is one of the 12 tribes of Israel, and of Ephraim, which, again, was one of the other 12 tribes of Israel. And so, very dark-skinned people, we would say even black people. So that's Joseph's history. And then we have Joshua. Joshua was the leader that took over after Moses, and Joshua was from the tribe of Ephraim, again, from the line uh, that we just talked about. And then we have Jethro. Now, Jethro was not on a TV show back in the, you know, in the 70s, the hillbilly. Jethro was actually the father-in-law of Moses. And Jethro was a black man, which means that Moses married his daughter, who was a black woman. And Jethro gave Moses some of the best leadership advice that history has known. Actually, what uh, he saw was Moses was struggling, trying to lead all of the people of Israel, and he was doing everything on his own, and Jethro came to him and said, Moses, you got all this wrong. What you need to do is you need to select men from these different areas, and then the people, uh, they can be the voice of the people back to you, and it's a representative form of government, which is exactly what our founding fathers in America, they patterned our form of government after the advice that Jethro gave to his son-in-law, Moses. And so that's Jethro. And then we have Rahab. Rahab is King David's great-grandmother, and she was a black woman from the line of Ham. That's Rahab. And then there's Ruth. Ruth was the grandmother of King David, and she, again, was from the line of Ham. That's King David, who King David is in the line of Jesus. Okay? Now we have Bathsheba, and Bathsheba was King David's wife, whose name literally means daughter of Sheba. Guess where she's from? She's from Africa. And then there's King Solomon, who also is in the line of David, and his mother was Bathsheba. Now, my point in saying all of this is not that Jesus was black. What my point is, is that he was a Jewish mixture, but he definitely had some black blood in his veins. And so when we think of Jesus, he's, he's not an Anglo. If that's a shock to you, he's just not. Then there's Zephaniah the prophet. Zephaniah the prophet was a black man descended from Africa, and he has a book in the Bible. All right, now we go to the New Testament and we were introduced to a man by the name of the Ethiopian eunuch. We don't know what his name was, but he was a eunuch from Ethiopia. You find him in in Acts chapter 8, and he was a high official from the administration of Candace, which was the queen of Ethiopia. This man was converted on his way back to Ethiopia, and he, we we believe that he is the one that actually took the, the church to Ethiopia that he was the beginning of the Coptic church or he was the, thing, uh, the person that made it grow because he was one of the first Christians that went back to Ethiopia and planted the Coptic church. And then there's a man by the name of Simon who is from Cyrene. Simon was an African descendant who helped Jesus carry his cross. So when they were crucifying Jesus and Jesus uh, gave way, his legs gave out, he was exhausted, this man, a black man from uh, Africa, actually helped Jesus carry his cross to Golgotha. And then there is Simon and Lucius, who in Acts chapter 13, they are black leaders in the church of Antioch who assisted in the ordinate, catch this, in the ordination and commissioning of the apostle Paul. They were leaders in the first century church. And so you see the lineage of black people and people of color all through 
the Bible. And it's not just in the Bible. Our uh, early church fathers, many of them, were black leaders. For example, uh, Augustine was a church father, early church father. He's probably the most scholarly and influential of all of the church fathers. And he was from Africa, of African descent. And then there's Athanasius, who again was a black man who became the bishop of Alexandria. And then there's Tertullian, who was one of the great African church fathers. And so as a people of color, we can look to the pages of Scripture for our identity. It's not just Anglos. I, I don't actually read of any Anglos in the Bible, just to let you know. But when we think about our heritage of people, whether they're your people of color or, or, well, all of us are color, aren't we? White's a color. Isn't it? Sure. But what I want you to understand is the history we have in the pages of Scripture, we don't have to look to American history for our founding or those kinds of things. We look in the pages of Scripture. And here's what I want you to understand. All people, all people are created in the image of God. There aren't different races. There is one race. The Scripture plainly teaches that all of us came from one man and woman, Adam and Eve. There aren't multiple races. There's only one human race. Y'all were family. We all are. And so when one of us hurts, all of us hurts. Now, there are different, different ethnicities. There are different culture groups. That is plainly taught in the, in the Bible. In fact, when they talk about nations, the word nations in the Bible, it is the term that means uh, ethnic groups or people groups. That's what it's talking about. So there's just one race. It's the human race race. And we're all, all of us are created in the image of God. And so when we think about uh, some people having uh, uh, feelings of superiority over other people, that just goes against the image of God in all of us. It goes against the image of God in all of us. So I want to take you to something that Jesus actually taught about this. Uh, it's a familiar story uh, that you've heard. In fact, hospitals have been named after this story. You'll find it interesting in the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, in chapter 10. This is what it says. Then an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus, saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Everybody had this question, and Jesus responds in verse 26. What is written in the law, he asked. How do you read it? And the expert responded, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Or as the King James says, love thy neighbor. Now, it's interesting uh, because this question is asked of Jesus a couple of different times, and sometimes the people answer back uh, with some of the Ten Commandments. But this phrase, love your neighbor, occurs one time in the Old Testament. It occurs in the book of Leviticus in chapter 19, verse 18, and it's at the end of the verse. So the, this command to love your neighbor only occurs one time in the Old Testament, and yet... That one phrase from this one verse in the Old Testament is repeated and quoted nine separate times in the New Testament. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. So love your neighbor. And then Jesus says in verse 28, you've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So the guy's feeling pretty good about himself. He's like, yep, I've got all the answers right. But he couldn't let it go. Verse 29, but wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In other words, do I have to love all people or just some people? Because I really don't want to love all people. I like to be able to carve out a group of people that I don't have to love. You see, there was prejudice among the Jewish people. In fact, in the Old Testament, there's an entire book that's based out of the prejudice of a Jewish man. His name was Jonah. 
And God told Jonah to go to a foreign nation, a foreign people group, and preach to them because if, if they did not repent, he was going to destroy them. And Jonah did not want to go to the nation of Nineveh or the city of Nineveh because he knew that if he preached that they would repent and he hated the Ninevites. And so he literally went in the opposite direction. And then God, in a very creative way, had him puked up onto the shores of Nineveh where he did preach to these people that he did not like, and they did, in fact, repent, and Jonah was mad. Jonah had prejudice against these people. And so Jewish people wanted to know, do we have to love everyone or just some people? And then it says in verse 30, Jesus took up the question. I'm so glad you asked. Jesus took up the question and said, and this is the story, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which is a very treacherous terrain, and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him and beat him and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened by, a religious leader happened by, happened to be going down the road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side, didn't want to get involved, didn't want to take responsibility, didn't want to help. In the same way, a Levite, another Jewish man, uh, when, when he arrived at the place, saw him. It's not like he didn't notice. He saw him, and he passed by on the other side. They're getting uncomfortable at this point. And they really got uncomfortable at this next one. Verse 33, but a Samaritan. Now, i got to say this. Samaritans were hated by the Jewish people. They had some history between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans were of of a similar lineage to the uh, the Jews, but the Jews felt like the Samaritans had compromised the faith because they had intermingled with people that they should not have um, intermarried together, and so the Jews called them half-breeds. Now, I hope that that strikes you odd because I just told, told you about the Jewish people, King David and his wife and all these other people who married outside of the Jewish faith. There are no pure Jews. There are no pure Jews today, and there, are no pure, uh, there were no pure Jews in any time in the Old Testament or in the New Testament. And yet, they felt superior, the Jewish people did, to the Samaritans. In fact, they didn't like them so much that when they had to travel north from Jerusalem to go north, Samaria was in this middle area. They would actually go out and around the Jordan River and then come back over the mountain's terrain to skip. They did not want a speck of dust on the sandal of a Jewish person, and so that's how badly they didn't want to be around them. That's pretty intense. That's like saying, you know what? I want to go from New York to Florida but I don't want to go through Georgia, Alabama, any of that. So I'm going to go to California and then come down through Texas and all the way. I mean, that's crazy, but that's what it's kind of like. And so he says, a Samaritan, verse 33, a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, he had compassion. Verse 34, he went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring, uh, uh, pouring on olive oil and wine, and then he put him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. He's generous. Like, he did not have to do this. He was a Samaritan. This other guy apparently was a Jewish man, and yet he took care of him. And then Jesus kind of goes for the jugular here, and he asked this religious leader, which of these three do you think uh, proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell in the hands of the robbers? And I wonder if there was a pause and he swallowed hard because the religious leader said, mumbled, the one who showed him mercy. Because Jesus told a brilliant story that you've heard. We're telling thousands of years later, hospitals are named after the good Samaritan. And Jesus told him, go and do the same. Jesus, who's my neighbor? Are there a group of people that I don't have to like? Are there a group of people that I don't have to love? And Jesus essentially says, no, there are not. Because all are valuable. All are worthy of sacrifice. All are worthy to be loved and cared for. All are. All are. So love your neighbor. 
The half-brother of Jesus, by the name of James, he would write uh, an epistle, a letter, a short letter in the New Testament. James, uh, if you don't know anything about James, James was a skeptic. He did not believe that Jesus was special or divine in any way. In fact, he was an unbeliever until after Jesus came back from the dead. And then James went all in and called him his Lord, his master. And James was a leader in the early church, and he remembered what Jesus taught about loving your neighbor. And you couldn't escape this whole idea of prejudice and bigotry in the first century church. And this is what James would write in James chapter 2, verse 1. He says this, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be grasping on just liking the people that are like you. Don't be favorites. Don't hold on to favoritism, bigotry, because you are a part of the faith of Jesus Christ. Then he says in verse 8, Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law, look what James calls this, if you fulfill the royal law, Uh, prescribed in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. Again, that phrase appears one time in the Old Testament, but it was such a profound and mandated thing that everyone knew we are to love all people. Indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. If, however, verse 9, you show favoritism, you commit sin. How clear is it? Favoritism, Prejudice, bigotry, or in our culture, we talk about racism. It is a sin, point blank. It just is. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the entire law and stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. So as people who would claim to be followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus... We should never have to answer, I mean, ask the question, do I have to love all people? Or can I just love the people that I want to love? And Jesus and James and the rest of the New Testament writers would say again and again and again, no, you must love all people. In fact, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my follower, that there isn't anybody that you don't love. You see, bottom line for today is, very simple. Racism is a sin and has no place in the church or in the life of a disciple of Jesus. Racism is a sin and has no place in the church or the life of a disciple of Jesus. And I think because racism never goes away, they were dealing with it thousands of years ago and today we still deal with it in humanity. We need to talk about it from time to time. And we need to be reminded from time to time that this this has no place in the church. And unfortunately, unfortunately, historically speaking, the church has promoted prejudice and bigotry and racism. People have used the Bible and select portions of the Bible to promote white supremacy, for example. It is wrong. It is a sin. It is an abomination to God. Now, I don't know churches, I can't point to a church today, but I know that in in our history and in the history of the church across the world, that has been done. And we scratch our kind of heads today thinking, how in the world could they do that and promote such a uh, doctrine of demons, which is what it is. There's one human race. We're all the same. We have equal value before God. And because there are people groups throughout the history of the world, who have been abused. Um, What you need to know is no one is a second-class citizen. No one is. And unfortunately, in our country and in countries all over the world, people feel that way. And it's not just about our ethnic uh, background. It goes to uh, rich versus poor. It goes to um, our gender, male or female. 
And any of that kind of bigotry, any of that kind of prejudice is just a flat out sin. And it is against the image of God in every human being. And so we have to be, as a church, we have to be very clear on this. And this is, again, this is not, I, we don't have a major problem at Journey, and I'm not thinking of anybody. I mean, it's just like, no, this is a problem that humanity has dealt with for thousands of years, and the people of God must stand strong and be clear because there may be some among us who struggle with this. And sometimes we don't even realize that we have prejudice in our hearts. And so today, all I want to do is, I, for those of you who have felt like I have been treated this way or I have been a second-class citizen or whatever it is, I just want you to know, you're not a second-class citizen. And you need to hear me as your pastor say, no one is a second-class citizen. All of us are made in the image of God. All of us have equal value before God. And I hope that just the history of uh, people of color in the scripture encourages you. And I hope for those of us uh, who don't have quite as much melanin in our skin appreciate the fact that there are a lot of people who have uh, paid the price and gone the way in our spiritual heritage that we benefit from who look different than us who are deficient in melanin. And it's kind of crazy because we're kind of jealous of all the melanin that some of you have. We're like, during the summer, we're like, you know what, lathering up, trying to get ourselves all dark. God made each of you exactly the way he wanted you to be. Every single one of you. And he loves every single one of us. And that should be the clear message of the church. And it is our clear message. Um, a friend uh, that I have come to know over the last couple of years sent me an email, and I'm going to read part of his email to you uh, with his permission. He says, um, as a child growing up in a military household, attending West Point, and then completing a 29-year military career, I've resided in 11 states and in seven foreign countries. I've moved 30 times and attended about as many different churches. In the military, they placed me everywhere from a mountaintop on Korea, in Korea, uh, all the way to the White House. In 2014, I worked for the Secretary of the Army. He was from New York, and because I was from Virginia, now, my friend is a black man, and the Secretary of the Army was a white man. Because I was from Virginia, he asked me how I felt about Monument Avenue in Richmond. As he looked out his window over the Potomac, he whispered, it's like they're still fighting the war. He says, I'll never forget the frustration on his face. Amazingly, he goes on, the number of sermons on race I've heard from the pulpit has been disappointingly rare, and even worse, mostly by black pastors expressing the hope that America would address race and racism. Other than the government, what organization has a greater impact on race relations in America? Other than government, what organization has had a greater impact uh, on race, or um, I didn't read that right. What organization has greater impact on race relations? What organization had a greater impact on race relations in America? The church, by commission and or omission, has been a tremendous, has had a tremendous impact on race relations in America. Unfortunately, to date, that impact has been very positive. And we can say, and I get it, I'm not, I'm not here to say that um, we haven't made progression as a country even over the last 50 years because we have. Any honest person would say, you know, it's, it's not like it was in the 50s or 60s here. But we still have room to improve. We still have a ways to go. Um, and he makes a very valid point. He says, with 330,000 local franchises, local churches, imagine the impact the church would have on America if only a fraction of those churches followed through with your, speaking of me, with your commitment to spend time preaching and teaching on race and racism. And so, I thought about that. 
I thought it, because he makes a great point, if the pulpits in America over the last 50 years were to talk about this subject, like I'm talking about it today, how many people would have been led out of the sin of bigotry and prejudice and racism? And how much different would our nation look? You see, the answer to um, the prejudice that sometimes we experience in life is not a government law or government program. I mean, you can try to restrain people by a law, but that doesn't change their heart. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ changes people's hearts. And if the church does not speak up on this, what's going to change? And so this is not a, I'm not browbeating anything, but I'm, this is a pastoral conversation. This is a pleading with the people of God to say, you know what, where racism exists, it needs to be, uh, needs to be called out. It needs to be saying, that is not okay, especially, especially, especially for the people of God. And for a long time uh, throughout history in different parts of the world, racism and bigotry and uh, prejudice have been allowed to exist with no one saying that's not okay. I, I grew up... Uh, and I don't remember ever hearing this subject matter talked about. Not, I'm not saying that it wasn't. I'm just saying I don't remember it. But, again, I lived in rural Indiana, small town of rural Indiana. There were virtually no minorities in the county in which I grew up. There just weren't. The first time there was a person of color in my high school was when I was in 10th grade. A single mom and her son moved to our town. That was the first time in my schooling that we had a person of color in my high school, or in my elementary school, or middle school. And fortunately for me, uh, they hired me, this mom and her son, they hired me to actually mow their lawn. And so every week, I was over there mowing their lawn. That was what I did, and I had a great opportunity to get to know her and get to know him, and I had many conversations. So it wasn't like a, I wasn't in an environment where, you know, we would talk about this because it just it wasn't, didn't present itself. But I pray, and for those of you who are here, or those of you who are watching, and if there are any pastors out there, I just, I challenge you, you know, on a regular basis, when we don't need to talk about it, we need to talk about it. Because when it comes to the point where we do need to talk about it, the emotions and the pain are so hot and so high, uh, I don't know how helpful those things are. We need to talk about it when things are, you know, kind of even keel, which is why we're talking about it today. So what do you do? What do you do with all this? Well, the application is very simple. The first thing is just to acknowledge the presence of racism in the world around us. I'm not saying that racism is the, you know, the biggest issue facing our country today. Some people say that. I don't, I wouldn't say that, but it is an issue. There is bigotry and Prejudice and racism, if you want to use that word, there is, there is that. And so to ignore that this is an issue in our culture or in our society is just not being honest, not being intellectually honest. And so we just have to say, you know what, it is real, it does exist, and it rips people apart. It wounds the soul of people who are made in the image of God. And regardless of your background, regardless of your experience, that sh- if you're a follower of Jesus, it should break your heart. And more than that, it should move you to action, to be a bridge builder. The second thing would be uh, to listen to everyone with respect. Like when you come, I'm, and this is, a, this is a complicated topic. Like some of you, when you realize what I was going to preach today, You've been nervous the whole time, like, oh, my goodness, I, I, you know, you're just nervous. But here's the thing. We can listen to each other, can't we? And just because you listen to someone doesn't mean that you have to agree with everything that they say. Right? But it does mean that we give other people the dignity of hearing them out. And I'm not just saying that, uh, you know, that the majority culture needs to listen to the minority culture. I think it's a two-way street. We all need to have an honest dialogue back and forth. If it's just a one-way street, we're not really going to accomplish anything. And don't assume that you know what the other person's going to say. Sometimes you may. And sometimes you may be surprised at what they say. But we have to listen to each other. And then... 
We have to bear with one another in love. Because there are going to be some times when we just come up and we just say, you know what, we, we, we're, we're, we're stretching, we're trying to lean in to each other, but we're, we, we just can't, there's going to be a gap there. We, we're not going to see eye to eye on everything. And in those moments, we have to bear up in love with one another. Some people are hard to love, aren't they? Yeah, don't look down the row. I saw some of you like, yeah, I know. Oh, that's right. But some people are hard to love. Some people in your family are hard to love. Some people uh, in your school are hard to love. Your workplace are hard to love. But as Christians, what do we do? We bear up underneath the load to love other people. And when it comes to this, uh, this issue of, uh, of bigotry and prejudice, and sometimes people are just going to act like a jerk. And we have to love them. And it's hard. And when they, I'm not, I'm, I mean, everybody can be a jerk, right? I mean, there's just not a group of people that has a, you know, a corner on the market when it comes to jerk. So we have to bear with one another in love. And when we talk about racism, there's, um, um, there's this idea, and I want to address this because I think some people are going to be nervous about it, so let me just say this up front. Um, or at the tail end, I should say. Um, people say that racism is only possible for those people who have power. That's being redefined today. That definition of racism is not biblical. It just isn't. Think about this. The Jewish people struggled with prejudice and bigotry toward pretty much the entire world like Rome and Gentiles. And the Jewish people had zero power, and yet they were guilty of what we would call the sin of racism, the sin of prejudice. And so prejudice and racism and bigotry, uh, it's a sin, and it's a sin that every child of God can be guilty of. No one has a corner on the market when it comes to prejudice and bigotry. It is something that we can equally be offending at. And then, the last thing I would say is this. Rid yourself of prejudice and racism. Rid yourself of prejudice and racism. You may think that you really don't struggle with this, and maybe you don't. But if you have a symbol that most of the world recognizes as a hate symbol, you should get rid of that symbol. No follower of Jesus should carry a symbol that historically communicates superiority or hatred or any of those kinds of things toward another group of people. And there are such symbols all across the world. We have ours. Uh, other countries have theirs. And for the people of God who love God and love Jesus and say, I'm, I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, none of those symbols should be uh, in our collection or on display in our homes or in our workplaces because it does not communicate the love of the Creator. And so I would just plead with you, um, if there's something in your life that moves in that direction, rid yourself of that. Repent of that and say, you know what, I, I'm going to follow Jesus. And a lot of what we think and believe and has been passed on to us. In other words, if you get you know, little kids of all kinds of different stripes and colors and you put them in a room, they're going to play with each other. Because they, don't, they, don't, they just see other kids. But we learn racism, we learn prejudice, we learn bigotry by people whose hearts have wandered far from the heart of God. And so we have to be careful about this. And so as your pastor, I want to say as clearly as I can that this is not a place for sin or bigotry or uh, the sin of racism or prejudice uh, because all of us, there's one human race, all of us are made in the image of God and all of us have equal value. No one is better than anyone else anywhere on the planet, but especially in this place. 
And so for those of you who at some times, maybe you're rich or poor or, you know, it, it could be a lot of different class issues or gender issues, you know, male or female, it's like feel like a second class citizen. No, that's not true in the body of Christ. You are loved by your creator. And you are loved by your pastor. And the best I can do is to lead in this and to challenge all of us to say, you know what? In our community, in our church, to the best of our ability, we will not tolerate prejudice or bigotry or hatred of any people group whatsoever. Racism, again, bottom line, is a sin. And it has no place in the church or in the life of a disciple of Jesus. Let's pray. God, thank you for the uh, moment that we can carve out uh, today and just talk about something that is so real for so many people and some of us struggle with. Father, for the wounds that have been created because of bigotry and racism and prejudice in our community, city, church, really around the world, Father, God, I pray that your people, the, those who name the name of Christ, those who would say, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus, that your Holy Spirit would convict us and turn us from this and that we would see people in, uh, uh, through your eyes, through how you see them and how you think of them. Father, I, I'm so grateful for this church, and this is um, just a delight, delightful group of people. And I pray that you could use us um, to help others come out and away from this terrible trap that Satan has laid upon the human race. Uh, may we be faithful. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.